So I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be able to, to um, give a talk here. I'm fascinated by the, the topic of this uh, conference. Um, and I'm also fascinated by what happens when you get together interdisciplinary groups. I mean, in this case, philosophers and climate scientists and, and mathematicians and a few others. Um, but of course, any such interdisciplinary meeting wouldn't be quite complete without somebody showing a cartoon that looks a little bit like that. <laughs> um, that we often end up talking across these gulfs to each other um, through lack of a common language, lack of a common terminology, uh, through, through different, uh, different concepts. Um, and there's a particular gap that um, I've been thinking about for a few years, which is the gap between the way people outside the climate science community talk about what climate models are and what they're being used for, and what I've observed going on on a day-to-day -day basis when I go into climate modeling labs and look at what they do. It's, 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 it's almost like night and day. And if we're going to talk about things like, well, um, when's a climate model fit for purpose, we ought to look at a much more detail about what's actually being done with these models in the labs. Um, and and, and it, what I'd like to be able to do is fill that gap. And so that's, that's really what the, the topic of the talk is. Um, I should explain a little bit of background. Um, I'm not a climate scientist. Um, my uh, background is in somewhere between computer science and anthropology um, in the sense that I study how teams of software designers, software engineers, managed to work together, managed to collaborate to successfully build pieces of software. And my, my main research method when I do this is what I characterize as a, a workplace ethnography. I spend extended periods of time uh, doing observational field studies of the software developers, looking at the tools and practices that they use and trying to make sense of them. Um, so the results here, I guess, started out from a study I did, um, started out uh, six years ago, um, I spent three months initially at the UK Mac Met Office, just uh, immersed in their climate modeling group, uh, sitting in on meetings, conducting a whole series of interviews with, with um, um, different modelers, and just understanding what it was, what it is that they do when they build climate models. And then two years later, I followed that up with a repetition of the study at three other centers, um, Max Planck, uh, NCAR in, in Boulder, and IPSL in Paris. So I, I've now got uh, four case studies and, and started to do some cross-case analysis. Uh, published a few papers describing some of this, but there's a whole load more results from these that I, I still need to, to get out and publish. Um, and get, to give you a sense of what I was doing in these studies, I had a whole series of initial questions uh, to guide the studies that focused very much on the software process itself. So when when they write code for these models, what do they do? And here were, here were my guiding questions. Um, how do the scientists themselves assess correctness of their code, of, of their models? Um, how do they ensure that uh, they get reproducibility? How do they develop a shared understanding when these codes are large and complex? And as we saw from, from Gavin's talk this morning, they are uh, huge complex codes. Um, and then the, the, the question about work prioritization. How do they prioritize what to do next? Um, what, what changes need to be made to the model, which features should they look at, and so on, and uh, how do they debug the software. And I mean, I can show you just some preliminary results. There is a paper describing, at least for the first case study, um, some of these initial results. And uh, I want to pick out in one in particular that jumped out at me, which is nobody in these labs talks about correctness of the code, because as soon as you ask them that question, they say, well, we, we, we we know, we know the models are incorrect. We know their approximations. There's no such thing as correctness. The concept doesn't even apply. What they talk about is model skill, and I'll say more about that in a couple of minutes. Um, they're continually reassessing the trade-offs that go into these models on a day-to-day -day basis. Almost every meeting I sat in had some version of a discussion about the different trade-offs of what gets resolved in the model and what doesn't, and, and how do we balance those competing needs, and so on. Um, and you know what, I, w I won't talk about any of the others because I've got uh, an example of how some of these practices actually work, which will be easier than, than talking through these. So let me focus on this question of model skill because um, after I characterized what goes on in these labs, I got really engaged in this question of model validity. What does it mean to say a model is valid or, or um, the other term, of course, would be fitness for purpose. And so when 
final model of answer this question, as I've said, they, they talk in terms of skill, and um, they do, this is from uh, Reichler and Kim's paper a few years ago. Um, they have these measures of skill where typically you take a whole series of fields that matter, you measure the error against an observational data set over the same period of time, and then you roll up all those different measures into a single skill score, and then you, you measure that of all the individual models. And this, is, this diagram is showing you over three generations of modeling, uh, roughly but not quite corresponding to the IPCC assessment reports. That, um, I uh, assume it one doesn't correspond to the, the, the early assessment reports. Um, but it's basically showing you an improvement in model skill over these generations of models. So each circle is an in individual model. Um, and, and the idea is, well, this is, this is the ground truth, which is a reanalysis product. Um, and then there's a whole question about, well, why, why is a reanalysis product the ground truth? And, and I'm not going to go there. But anyway, so a perfect score on this measure of skill would be here. And you can see over the generations, the models are doing better and better. So that's, uh, <coughs> that's what they mean by skill. But note a couple of themes here. One is, and, and um, Gavin de described it very clearly this morning, skill is not in any sense an absolute measure. It's, it's a relative measure between two models. You can only really say one model is more skillful than another. And it's always re with respect to some choice over which variables, which fields you're looking at. So, so skill is a very, it's a very relative measure, and it depends on some, sub some subjective choice about, well, which fields did you, did you think were important. One of the visualizations that I saw being used at the Met Office fascinated me, was this one. And I haven't really seen other people pick up anything like this and talk about it. And, and, and it took me about an hour for one of them to walk me through what this shows. But let me see if I can explain it in like two minutes. So this is a, this is a, a visualization of the difference in skill between two different models. Where, when I say different models, they're actually, one model is a tiny increment over the other. In other words, we've gone in and we've changed a few lines of code, which in theory should improve the model's skill in some specific way. And we've captured on a single diagram what the difference is in skill. So there's a whole load of fields along the bottom here. It doesn't re really matter what they are, but just to give you some sense, um, mean sea level pressure in different parts of the year, um, surface latent heat flux, precipitation, and you know, they're, they're, they're uh, um, arrayed spatially and temporally and so on. Anyway, whatever, whatever those set of fields they picked out that matter to them. The whiskers on here, everything on this graph is normalized to one. So the whiskers on here show you, this is, uh, how do I put it? This is the, um, this is where we want to be. This is the range of variability that would be considered okay as a, as a good match for that variable. And so if your data point falls within the whisker, you're considered to have sufficient skill on that variable. So for example, this one here, this uh, data point here, shows that for this variable, we're within where we should be to be considered skillful on that, on that variable. For this one, we're not. And then the data points, uh, so one here represents the old model. So everything is norm normalized to the score of the old model for errors on all of these fields. And then the new model is, is the color data point. So if we're above one, it means we did worse on that variable. If we're below one, we did better. And then they've colored them to say, uh-oh, the red ones are the bad ones. That was where the previous model did, did better and we've got worse. The green ones are where we, uh, sorry, the orange ones are where the old model um, wasn't good enough, the, the new model is doing better. And the green ones are where well, we're already within where we're supposed to be, so that's fine. Okay, so it's a one-shot visualization of the relative skill of one model against the next. And uh, oh, okay, that blows me away. And this is the kind of thing that they're using regularly when they make small changes to the model to say, well, did we improve the skill of the model? So if that's the kind of thing that they're doing when they make small changes to the model, what does that tell us, I guess, about the bigger question of model validity? And well, let me, let me characterize it like this. We often... Uh, certainly uh, at the, the very high level, the philosophical level, shall we say, we say, look, well, validity is about the relationship between models and observational data, okay? And the closer the model is to the observational data set, the more valid it is. And we're looking at things like well, fidelity, which is how well does it match current data, and then predictive power, how well does it match 
new data that's collected after we did the, the model, right? In other words, the, the predictive power. But the problem is we have, in, the cli in climate modeling, we already know the models are, are approximations. And so it's wrong to say how close are we to the data because we know we're never going to get a match. So there's no such thing as truth here. There's no such thing as saying the models match the data exactly because they're not supposed to. Um, and then we have the issue where we've got the George Box quote that everyone in climate modeling quotes sooner or later. We all know models are wrong, some are useful. But there's an equivalent of it which I've never really seen anyone articulate clearly, which is you can just replace the word models in here with data, and we know all data are wrong as well for exactly the same reasons that all models are wrong. All the data is approximation. And one of the things I've observed talking to a lot of the modelers is they're frequently faced with the case now where you know they've got a particular version of the model they're running with, they run an experiment, they're looking at the model output in relation to the observational data, and they don't match, and you get that, that yikes moment that Linda talked about um, uh, yesterday. You get that yikes moment. They don't match, and, and, and so clearly something's gone wrong. And what I've heard many of them say is that it's just as likely now when we get that yikes moment that the problem is in the observational data rather than the model. So Gavin gave an example this morning about ocean heat content, and there are loads more in the literature where it turned out the, the model was correct and it was the observational data that was wrong. So we've got this problem that if we want to measure model validity in terms of this relationship, we've got errors in here and we've got errors in here, we actually don't have a ground truth. And so I don't think this is a very productive way to think about model validity. So let me perhaps offer a different way of thinking about model validity. And I haven't pushed this very far, so treat this as a very preliminary ideas, and, and you tell me if they're useful or not. So what's the purpose of a climate model? We talk about fitness for purpose. And I've seen climate models in these studies used for a whole range of different things. And I've put a partial list here, and I'm sure there's some things I've missed off here. But let me, let me give you some sense of them, and, and I'll explain them with respect to uh, this understanding of what we do when we do modeling. That we have an observational system, and by an observational system, I mean the thing that Paul was talking about this morning. That huge infrastructure that gathers data from around the world over long periods of time, processes it in various ways, and makes it available to different communities of science. So it is a huge system. Okay, It's not a simple set of measurements. It's a, it's a complex system. We have a theoretical system, which uh, is the, the set of, of, of uh, theories that we have about how the physical climate system works. And we have a calculation system, which we often refer to as a model. But I want to say in a minute that that's a hugely complex system as well. And as soon as you say a model, you're fooling yourself. There is no such thing as a model. And, and let me elaborate on that in a minute. So, so what are these things used for? Well. They used to explore the consequences of current theory. If our theory about how the climate system works is correct, we ought to see the following thing happen in the model, do we? And if we don't, well, the model might not have captured what we need to to test that theory, the theory might be wrong, and so on. So we'll run an experiment. Um, we might test a hypothesis about the observational system. We'll say, we'll say, well, if the observational system is working in the way it should, the following phenomena um, ought to be measurable, and how would they actually show up in the observational system? And you can play with a model to get some sense of what ought to show up in the observational system when a particular phenomena occurs. Uh, we test hypotheses about the calculation system. Does, the, does the, the calculation system do what we think it does? Does it resolve a process in the way that we think it does? Um, we can use a model to produce homogenized data sets and the reanalysis data that we then subsequently treat as observational data is actually the output of the climate model, and that's another interesting problem. Um, uh, to conduct thought experiments about different climates. You know, what if humanity turned off all emissions from tomorrow? What happens over the next 40 or 50 years to the climate system? It's a thought experiment. It's not in any sense a real world experiment. It can never happen, but you can play with that in the model. Or what if the Earth had no land mass? We'll just have a water planet. What's the climate look like on that? Again, it bears no relation to any reality, but it's a thought experiment that helps us think about the relationship between these two systems. And then finally, way down at the bottom, I've got providing inputs to assessments for policy making. And that dominates a lot of the compute cycles in the supercomputer centers 
for the modeling centers, and, and I did my second set of studies when they were right in the middle of the CMIP-5 runs, and everybody's tearing their hair out for we've got a deadline to get the runs done, we've got to prepare them, we've got to get the model configuration. Huge amount of effort involved in supplying those inputs. And the scientists basically saying, God, we're just going to get this out of the way because we want to get back to doing science. To them, this is the least interesting use of a climate model. The least interesting use. And yet, to communities outside climate science, that's what they see. That's what they think a climate model is built for. It's not. It's never built for that. That's almost an accidental byproduct of the climate modeling. The climate model is built for all this other stuff. Okay. So when we talk about fitness for purpose, exactly. yeah. Yeah, go on. Absolutely. No, uh, the I, IPCC. I, I think think CMIP five and IPCC assessment reports. Do you, that includes climate analysis. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. The other problem that's going on here, of course, is I, I've said there's no such thing as an individual model. I said that the, the model itself is a complex system. Um, the the group of people building climate models is also a complex system in the sense that you've got multiple overlapping communities of expertise some of whom find it just as hard to collaborate as you know, any interdisciplinary group with those gulfs that I showed you at the beginning. And the coupled model system becomes the, the focus for that collaboration. And there's a huge amount of organizational effort in terms of working groups and committees and so on to make sure all of those different communities of scientists are, communicated, uh, are communicating well, coordinating their efforts, and building a coupled system that works. And in many cases, there are very few people in the, in the climate modeling lab that concern themselves with a the coupled model as a whole. They concern themselves with their piece. You know, the ocean modelers, where are the ocean modelers? The ocean modelers care about the ocean component of the coupled model. The atmosphere, atmospheric physicists care about the atmospheric model. Most of them don't care about the coupled model, and so you've got this tension going on between the science that you'd want to do with a standalone ocean model or an atmosphere model and the science that you might need to do with a coupled model if you're studying climate change, and you've got that kind of tension going on. Um, Paul showed this slide this morning, so I don't think I, I, I need to. We're, we're about to publish this paper, so it'll be out real soon, but it was an analysis of uh, how the models are all different with respect to the balance of the different kinds of science going into them. That different models have, sorry, different labs have different emphasis on the kind of expertise they have at that lab, and therefore their models tend to specialize in different areas. Some of them have put much more expertise into their ocean modeling, some into the atmosphere modeling, some into the carbon cycle modeling, and so on. So each lab tends to specialize in certain parts of the overall domain coupled model system. You were, you were able to see them. I'll show, you, I'll show you the models afterwards, don't worry. Okay. So, what do I mean then by, um, um, uh, sorry, what, what am I suggesting as ways forward if validity of an individual model is impossible? So, here's, here's a picture, and, and what I want to talk about corresponds to external validity in the same sense that we would use it in any empirical study, which is, uh, how much, oh, I'm not doing well for time, right? Three minutes. Okay. Four question period. For, oh, right, if you want questions, all right, good. Okay. So, so, so here's my here's my system, right? We have we have a running climate model, and when we talk about model validity, we talk normally talk about that black box and the outputs of that black box matching some observational thing. But that's never how they're used. First of all, there's a huge process involved in figuring out which configuration of which model you need for which particular run. That is not a simple process. And if you've ever tried to get a climate modeler to describe the configuration so that you could redo it later, it's impossible. There is so much goes into that. So, so a climate model is an individual model. It's a whole family of models and a huge number of different configurations of those models. And the question is, well, which one did you pick for the particular experiment and why? And then there's the process by which results are interpreted, in which you never take the raw output of the model and say something about it. You interpret it in the light of the strengths and weaknesses of the model, in terms of the theory that we're exploring, in terms of what we've learned from other model experiments and so on. So, so the, if we're talking about validating a model, 
I think we need to spend much more time looking at this process and this process and much less time talking about the relationship between the inputs and the outputs of the calculation system. And um, let me give you then one other, um, one other picture here, because when I say, well, how do, how do they build the models on a day-to-day -day basis? What do they do? And it looks typically like this. You start off with a yikes, and the yikes, the yikes is a completely normal step in this kind of science. The yikes is, well, there's something here that's wrong in the model. And that, that happens on a day-to-day -day basis because we know the models are wrong, right? So, so you start off with a yikes, and, and maybe you want to prioritize your yikes. Which one should we work on today? Okay? And you develop a hypothesis. You say, well, okay, here's what I think is a reasonable hypothesis for why that yikes exists. And um, you then design an experiment, and a computational experiment typically involves a small perturbation to the model. I think it's due to a particular process, let's say it's the radiation scheme, and I think there's something in the radiation scheme that we, we know we've always wanted to work on, and, and I think that's the cause of this particular problem. So you change a few lines of code, and now you've got a formal experiment. Your control is the old version of the model. Your experimental case is your, your modified version of the model. You run the experiment and you interpret the result. Is your hypothesis correct? And typically that's framed in terms of, did I see the improvement in skill that I was expecting Remember, these, are very, these two models are very, very similar to each other. Did I see improvement in skill I was expecting on the fields that I was expecting, and did anything else get messed up spatially or temporally? And you might run that a number of times, and if you think your hypothesis is now correct, you've got enough evidence, you then have to go through a peer review process with all of those various working groups in the lab to say, well, here's what I think will fix that process, here's all my evidence, would you now accept that back into the baseline of the model? And that's also a very complicated process. Well, how do you get your change actually accepted into a new baseline of the model? And it can take months or even years for, for that change to get accepted. And let's say you go through this process successfully, you've, you've convinced everybody your hypothesis is correct, this is an improvement to the model, it gets rid of that yikes, here's the new version of the model, and then we start again with the next yikes. And we go round and round that cycle. That's what doing science is about. Right? It's forming hypotheses, it's constructing experiments, and it's using the peer review process to convince other people uh, about what the finding is. So what I call constructive validity then is the question of how well does the model construction process in each lab conform to some version of this? In other words, how well are they doing this as an experimental science? And if they are, then I'd say the models have some constructive validity. Of course, how you measure that's another question. And, uh, So let, so let me move to the summary then. So models and data are both approximations. Talking about um, the relationship between them, I don't think is very productive, um, except on, on the basis of, of improvements in model skill, not in any absolute sense. There's no such thing as a unitary model. Any individual model is merely one instance of a long chain of development of that model and a particular choice of configuration for an experimental run. So when we talk about validating a climate model, and I say which model, you're going to take several days to answer that question. Um, uh, any model execution is embedded in, in this complex community of expertise, so fitness for purpose must take into account the process of model configuration and the way the results are interpreted. We don't ever use raw model results for anything. Um, and then I've suggested two kinds of validity that we might want to look at that I think are being missed at the moment, and I think they're important.
Shukla say a realistic global analysis model, so a data analysis model, can be viewed as a unique and independent observing system that can generate information at a scale finer than that of the conventional system. Right. So the model, what they're saying is the model data are better yes. than the observations are. Yeah. And, and, and Wendy wants to ask a question because this is exactly what we were talking about over lunch, right? Oh, you know, I just completely agree. And just as trying to think about how to, how to map that process on this concept of the measurement data. But my, my question is actually on a different topic. Okay. So I'll just yield happy to let you. That's great. Yeah. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm not going to. Absolute. So. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many choice quotes in that paper, too. That, that yeah. it's, a, it's a fun paper. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, to the point about fitness for purpose being this broad thing, I completely agree. And I feel like, you know, I'm someone who's pushed the adequacy for purpose thinking. And I think a real problem with the way I first articulated it was that I, or I tended to do it in such a way that the purpose was really identical with what I would now call the goal. And I think the right way to think about a purpose now is that a purpose is a function of the users, the methodology, and the goal. Right. And so what you really want to know is, is a model adequate for achieving a certain goal for a set of users in the context of a specific kind of methodology? Yep. And so just listening to you talk about, yes, that, that's exactly what the way I now think is the right way to talk about fitness for purpose. So Good. I just wanted to, to yeah. say that. Yeah, thanks. And I, and I agree with that point. I've got, uh, there's a longer version of this talk where I get a little bit more into, yeah, the, it, fitness for purpose is a very complex relationship between all of those things. Because you see instances where a climate model is used, um, and it, it relates to the, the, the thoughts this morning we had about open open source modeling, just giving your climate model to somebody else, um, that other people will pick up that model and they'll use it for stuff. And many of the stuff that they use it for, the people that built it would throw up their hands in horror and say, no, it, it, no, don't use it for that. It, it, it's useless for that. But there's, not, there's no easy way for us to describe that, to say, here's what it's appropriate to use this model for and here's what it's not appropriate to use this model for. We don't even have the vocabulary for that. when you were having the list of all the different kinds of, say, let's say, goals or types of practices in which you might yep. use the model. I think like it's absolutely right to point out that there are there's this wide range of uses. But I think it's also important to remember, I would argue that it's important to keep in mind also that a lot of those uses are still going to depend on being able to make arguments about fidelity and so on, yep. even if they are not the, you know informing decisions. Yep. Uh, so actually, they require a lot of the same kinds of arguments yep. Yes, okay, no, ab absolutely, I take your point, and that's important. And one of the things I forgot to say is, I, I feel that's accounted for, and maybe I didn't draw it out closely enough, um, but when I, when I uh, show this diagram here, the run experiment is the, is the place where that fidelity question is asked, because, uh, well, actually, you know, as you've asked, I'll show you one more diagram. But here's a visualization that I saw being used at the, at the UK Met Office that fascinated me. So it's a four-up display. This is generated automatically from the model output and given um, uh, by, our, by the website that, that takes care of model runs to the person that set up the experiment. So this is one of the first things they'll look at after the experiment is completed. And, and it could take a couple of weeks to do a, a, a full uh, run of a, a global climate model, let's say over the century scale. So, so this is one of the first visualizations they'll look at. And they've set up this experiment with um, oh gosh, now can I explain it very carefully? They've got three things they're looking at here. So remember, it's a, it's a controlled experiment. The control case is the old model version. The experimental case is this minor modification, a new little piece of code um, that's been inserted into the model. And there's also the observational data. In this case, the ERA40 data set um, that's taken as a ground truth. And what you're doing is you're saying, right, well, here is the raw results for the new version of the model. So this is the experimental case for some field, I don't know whatever, whatever it is, pressure, at, uh, mean pressure at sea level, um, uh, average somehow, I don't care how. Anyway, right, this is, uh, this is the difference. So this is the, the new version of the model uh, with the old model that they've subtracted. So this is the literal difference for this particular field between the old and the new version of the model. Okay, so you can see where we made a change in the model. We made a change in particular just around the, the Antarctic Circle. And that's, of course, what this particular experiment was, gained, was aimed to do. It was aimed, aimed to reduce the error, the model error in that region. So, okay, that's our first indication that, that something's going right for this change. 
This one down here is the, the control run, the old version of the model minus the observational data. And this is the new version of the model minus the observational data. So now we can see, well, how much error was there in the old version of the model? How much error is there in the new version of the model? And how's the spatial pattern of that error changed? And are we getting what we thought we would get by making that change to the model? And um, there's a very subjective judgment in how you read these graphs. And I w watch people looking at them. And I, what, what do you look for in this thing? But you know, it's well, this big patch of blue here, that's, that's bad. And it's slightly less blue here, so that's better. Um, and I'm not sure I can explain it any better than that, but <laughs> there we go. So we have one more question from Legend. Yeah, so it's actually a combination of this issue about the data being wrong, and it was really inspired by your comment, which is that it's certainly true the data are inadequate. But if you look at, or inaccurate, sorry. Um, but if you look at the range of diversity of model values, even for global mean temperature, that's about three degrees. And this is hugely greater than, 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 the, than the uncertainty in the actual global mean temperature. And even if it wasn't, it's not internally consistent across the models. So, so while we can't use the data without considering its uncertainty as a gold standard, the models are not internally consistent, even in terms of global mean temperature. So we can argue that's not important, but that's a different statement than saying sort of the models are all together within the noise. But so. Yeah, so this is, this is in some sense a question about model ensembles and climate sensitivity. And, you know, we, no, we no, have, this is just the mean temperature. Yeah, no, I know. But, but, but the, one of the reasons the models disagree about mean temperature, oh, so, sorry, mean temperature ju just when you're doing you a, a, you a pre-industrial control run. This, their, mean, their mean global temperature averaged over the entire century, whatever you want. Okay, all right, so with, without any change in forces. Yes? Either way. Okay, all right. I, I don't actually have the graph of the natural runs in front of me, okay. but I'm pretty right. sure it looks the same. So, so there's a very simple answer to that, is that given how different these models are in terms of which bits of physics have been incorporated into the different models, of course they're going to be different. Of course there's going to be a range of results. I'm just, yeah. And, and, and that, that should not be problematic. In other, in other words, you can't require these models all to converge because each of them is going through a very complex ongoing development process where new science is being stuck into the model at all different times and different bits of science is being put into different models. So you would expect that kind of diversity, absolutely. So maybe we can follow up on break. There's one more question now from Reto. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to frame it, but I think you started that as a software engineer trying to study the sort of coding practices in climate models, but it seems to me that you've learned more about sort of social science questions of how things are decided and which choices are made and how these people work together. And, uh, what do you think is actually more important in the work you've done, or, or is it actually hard to separate these two things? Well, I, I don't separate them, and I should say that's, that's not really a process. I started out with that. My, my work going way back even before I started looking at um, climate models, it, it takes a very sociological view of software development. And there's a small community of people in software engineering who that's what they do. They say the most important thing about software engineering is how the hell do these highly expert technical people manage to coordinate things to build million lines of code software that actually does something useful? And it's a sociological problem. So in my view, of course it's important, but then you know that's that's my bias because that's my background. Do you think the sociological aspects are more important than the actual software engineering tools that they use and the I do. I, and so on? Yeah, I do, but most of my colleagues in software engineering don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much.